do you mean for the world? Well, uh, that's a good question. And this is a subject that I really like to talk about. Um, but first, I want to mention climate change, because that is the reason that it is so important to switch to thorium, because of its many, many advantages. Um, our adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere by burning carbon to generate electricity is one of the main factors that has caused global warming. So it's important that we stop generating electricity with burning carbon. And in the past, we have, as you know, used uh, um, light water reactors to do that, that use uranium. But thorium is a much better alternative, and many nations are now moving toward that. Um, and that's nothing new, by the way. The first thorium burner in the world was at Shipping Port, Pennsylvania back in the 1950s. This, this plant ran on either thorium or uranium very successfully. Um, in addition, there was a reactor built at Oak Ridge, Tennessee in the United States that ran for 22,000 hours alternating between uranium and thorium with, with great success. And uh, that reactor was called a molten salt reactor. And that is the sort of reactor that works very well with thorium. Um, some of your viewers not, uh, might not realize that the big difference between uranium and thorium is if you use uranium in a, in a uh, power plant, you, you use only a tiny amount of the fuel you put in there. If you use thorium, it is 95% at least consumed. So you have very, uh, you have a lot less residue. Um, <clears throat> that plant at Oak Ridge ran consecutively for 22,000 hours. And when it came time to shut it down, all they did was walk over to the wall and trip the switch and the, and the uh, liquid fuel inside drained down into a big tank where it solidified and turned into a big pancake. And that, if there had been one of these at Fukushima, there would have been nothing. Nothing would have happened. Um, in fairness, though, we have to admit that the plant at Fukushima had been running for uh, 40 years generating millions of kilowatts of carbon dioxide free power. Um, <clears throat> I want to explain that there are several varieties of molten salt reactors, so I'm going to have to generalize a little. Uh, the reactor that is common worldwide uses uranium pellets. They are solid. They are stacked in tubes. And if things get out of hand, they can melt. If they melt, they damage the tubing that reacts with the water and you get hydrogen. And that is what exploded at Chernobyl and Fukushima. In a molten salt reactor, there is no uranium. There is no tubing. Um, and there is no water for cooling. So you don't get hydrogen to, to enable a hydrogen explosion. Um, <clears throat> they have many safety features. Um, one of them being, well, first of all, let me mention, um, when you mine uranium, it's, you only get the good stuff that does the work as a tiny percentage of the volume of ore. So you have to refine it. Thorium is another matter. Um, in a properly designed reactor, you consume more than 95% of that thorium, um, which obviously makes it far more efficient. In addition, um, the supplies of thorium, the natural supplies on Earth as ore, um, is about four to five times greater than the supplies for uranium, which means that uh, 
between the two of them, we have many thousands of years um, of uh, available material for generating electricity. The idea that people have that, oh, well, that's not renewable because you mine it um, is absurd because there's so much there um, that we will have enough way beyond our needs uh, after we get fusion reactors, which are another type that are even more efficient. Um, I'd like you to imagine a big loop, uh, a plumbing loop where you have a liquid, and this happens to be a liquid fluoride salt in which the thorium is dissolved. And this circulates in this loop. So, um, and the, the fluid is not only the part that is reacting and generating heat, it is also um, the coolant. So as I say again, no water. Oh, before I forget, uh, almost every conventional um, power nuclear power plant has this huge concrete um, containing dome that is not necessary when you're using a molten salt reactor particularly with thorium, because it operates at atmospheric pressure. Um, and there, there is no high pressure at all. The temperatures are high, but water's not involved. So if you have a leak of water, um, you don't have, so in a common reactor, if you have a water leak, you have to worry because that increases volume by a thousand times. That's why you need that big concrete uh, silo, but it's not needed with a molten salt reactor, because there's no water to expand. Um, <clears throat> one of the most remarkable things about molten salt reactors is you have the circulating fluid in which the reaction is going on. If for some reason, and I'm not sure even what, it would start to over overheat, um, the uh, fluid expands and that slows the reaction because there's more space between the atoms. If it slows down too much, there's less space and you have more strikes with the neutrons and it warms up again. So it's kind of uh, like a self-controlling engine. Um, it's automatic. Another advantage, which is beautiful, that relies on physics alone, not human intervention, is the fact that if for some reason that it did overheat, they have designed in a plug in the bottom of this big loop. And in that, some of that molten salt is cooled by a refrigeration unit into a solid plug. If for some reason you lose electricity to that, uh, um, circuit, the air conditioning, the cooling can't work. So immediately that frost plug melts and all of this drains into this big tank and cools and solidifies into that same big pancake that you had at Oak Ridge. So it's automatic if there is, a, for some reason, an overheat. Um, that is not the sort of thing that you experience with current light water reactors. And that is a huge benefit. And as I say, this isn't theoretical. This is what was done at Oak Ridge. They just cut the power. And that is still there today. <clears throat> um, as I mentioned, if one of these had been at Fukushima, it would have been a non-event. Um, one of the other advantages is that molten salt uh, reactors that use uh, thorium, uh, and by the way, they can also use uranium, but thorium is preferred because it's efficiency, um, can also consume, consume the stored nuclear waste from all of these light water reactors we have around the planet. Actually, all of those pellets, when they're removed from the actor, uh, uh, reactor, are 95% U-238 plus some plutonium. 
all of that is fuel in a molten salt reactor. So the advantage is we can take that material that people think of as waste, which is really fuel, and consume it, convert it into electricity in a molten salt reactor, preferably fueled with thorium because of its efficiency. Um, that's a huge advantage. Let me tell you, uh, give you an example, I think that you'll be able to um, visualize. An American football field is about 100 yards long and about, I think, 50 yards wide. I'm not sure about the width. Um, but if you took all of the uh, residue from our um, operating of nuclear power, you could put all of that since the, and then that's in the last 70 years on one football field to a depth in these canisters, they're about 13 feet tall in one football field. Now imagine with a molten salt reactor powered by thorium consuming 90% of that, all of a sudden you've got what's only what's left is between 10 yards and the, and the goalpost. It's amazing that we could convert this to energy rather than have the expense of storing it. Um, I can't overstress the advantage of having them uh, not need water cooling. Think of arid areas that need a power plant. In the past, these light water reactors have had to be sited next to a major river or on a coastline or on a large lake, I mean, a really big lake, but with the molten salt reactor that doesn't require water cooling, they can be in the desert. Think of what that could mean to um, African countries or um, uh, Mongolia or many of these areas that are basically uh, very arid and get very little rain. Um, and incidentally, many of them are already um, seeking to get these sort of reactors built from uh, companies like South Korea, China, Russia, because they are building them for export. Um, the other advantage that I briefly mentioned was that they operate at atmospheric pressure. Um, and that is critically important. The uh, Russian power plant at Chernobyl did not have a containment dome. If they would have, they would have done much better. But without it, um, the water burst into steam, you got hydrogen and you had an explosion. Um, but if you're operating at atmospheric pressure, there is no pressure to do any of that. So that's a great advantage. Um, <clears throat> another advantage for this is that molten salt reactors are ideal for desalinating water. All around the world, there are areas where there is a shortage of fresh water. Um, and these are highly efficient uh, ways to produce pure water. We have one or two operating in the United States now, I believe in California, and they could be doing this worldwide. And again, most efficiently, if they use molten salt reactor that fueled with thorium. Um, the technical term for that is liquid fluoride salt reactor. Um, so if you ever hear that, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, and as I mentioned, the residue is so much less than a conventional reactor. Um, the other advantage is, since this is a circulating, um, let's consider it a circular pipe that you could put a valve in anywhere. As your thorium is used up, you can supply more through one valve. You can also take off, uh, drain some out while it's operating from another valve and chemically remove the breakdown products that you don't want in there anymore. So it does not need to be shut down for refueling. You can add fuel 
and drain off uh, um, to chemically remove uh, breakdown products as it's operating. On the normal reactor that's in use today, you have to shut down approximately every three years for several weeks, which is one reason why light water reactors like our common use um, have an efficiency of about 90%. If they were molten salt reactors, they would be way up close to 100%. Um, because you don't have that long shutdown every now and then. Um, cost is another factor. Um, I just read an article that compared the cost of per kilowatt hour generated of light water reactors that we're accustomed to and uh, molten salt reactors. And it appears that with these model, modular, small modular reactors, the cost per kilowatt hour is about half of what it is with the light water reactors that we are accustomed to. Even though they are efficient, these molten salt um, reactors are even more um, economical and decent investments, which should encourage industry. Um, one of the difficulties that promoting uh, power generated with thorium or uranium is the fact that in the United States, for example, it is insufficiently subsidized. Let me give you an example. For every megawatt generated, wind power gets something like um, 20 times as many dollars as, as uh, nuclear power. And solar gets 250 times as much. Now, that's quite a hill to work against. That's quite a disadvantage. And so when people talk about, well, nuclear is expensive, they're talking about the plant. They're not talking about the cost per kilowatt hour if you remove all of these roadblocks that are in the way. In addition, in the United States and perhaps elsewhere, we are required to set aside a certain percentage of the profits that a nuclear power plant makes for eventual decommissioning, but that is not done against wind or solar. So the, the playing field is not uh, fair, and that is something to guard against and try if it exists where you are or elsewhere in the world to try to get removed because they should be judged on their merits. How, how efficient are they? How environmentally benign are they? And that's another matter that uh, people should understand. The rush to renewables was based on a anti-nuclear bias fueled by the carbon companies who profit and are buying into wind and solar because they are so inefficient. Wind uh, generates about 33% of its plate rated power. And the rest has to be supplied by burning coal or natural gas. Well, that keeps the carbon industry in business. Um, in addition, um, Solar is even worse. It's 20% efficient. So 80% of their stated rated power output is provided by burning coal or natural gas. Whereas with uh, either uranium or thorium, um, which are 90, pl 90 plus percent efficient, um, uh, that's not necessary at all. They are grid level um, power plants. Um, I want to mention something. People hear the word fluoride and they think they know that some people know that fluorine can etch glass and it's a potent thing. So they think fluoride and they're worried about it. Well, fluoride, when combined with salts uh, into a salt, um, are extremely stable. They could tolerate immense heat. So the reactor is designed to easily accept the heat levels that are required 
and the so and the um, the fluoride salt um, is an ideal sol uh, solvent for the thorium um, solute. Um, finally, or almost finally, they are highly scalable. We've got into the um, power generation business with uranium using a model that was similar to the reactor that was in Admiral Heiko, Heim, um, Rickover's submarine. And we base, and they made a bigger one. And of course, it's normal for a submarine. It's in the water. Why not have water cooling? And they really gradually built larger and larger reactors. Well, we made them up. Now we have, we're, we're up to millions of megawatts out of one unit. Um, and uh, the nice thing is these are scalable. You can make 100 megawatt unit. And if you need more, you make another 100 megawatt unit. If for some reason you have a problem with one, you're not entirely down. You're only half down. And that is what the Navy has done instead of expanding to a bigger reactor and a bigger one and a bigger one to power the aircraft carriers, they use the modular system. And uh, molten salt reactors are ideal for that. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's not only uh, physically sensible, it's economically sensible because modular means you can build them practically on an assembly line. Um, in addition, there's a safety factor that because they are so much smaller, they can be buried near the site where they're needed. A city of 30,000 could have their own reactor easily, and that could be trucked in on like four semis. Um, if we had the interest and the dedication and the concern that we should have about the environment, we should be replacing every carbon burner in every power plant with a molten salt reactor, preferably powered by thorium. That would make a huge difference in the amount of carbon dioxide we are pouring into the atmosphere. And I wanna close with something again about the environment. Um, and compare it to the alternatives that nuclear power must compete with. The amount of material that you must mine to get a, let us say, 100 million megawatts of power from a nuclear reactor compared to wind or solar, it's like 12 times more for um, wind and way more for solar. In addition, so the mining has a carbon footprint. Almost all mining is done with diesel. It might be diesel electric, but it's diesel. Um, and the other final thing is that plant life, people don't think about plant life. Molten salt reactors, like our previous ones, have at least 60 year plant life and probably more. But Wind and solar have 20 year half-life and then they have to be recycled as hazardous waste that is permanently hazardous. So the public doesn't know that and most of our legislators don't know that. And that is why I, um, in cooperation with the many uh, energy experts I connect with wrote this book titled Unintended Consequences, The Lie That Killed Millions and Accelerated Climate Change. Um, and because I am so concerned about the environment, I'm making that book available free to everybody. It can be downloaded at this website And with that, I think I'm about done, unless you have some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Erickson, very enlightening. 
Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, uh, I have two questions, kind of, okay. that I was thinking about. That was really interesting. I really love that you mentioned um, the fact that solar and wind, uh, the whole issue with that you can't recycle it that easily, because this is something that I think people don't, th like that I didn't know personally. Yeah. Yeah. And that is quite intuitive that makes you go, go like, ah, for renewables, because first of all, they're, as you said, ineffective. So you need to have all this stuff. And second, like you need more of them. And second of all, you have to recycle it constantly. So how sustainable is it actually? Right. And it kills like so many, like it kills like the nature. We have these in Denmark, like the wind ones, we have them in yeah. Denmark everywhere, completely decimates like. <laughs> yeah, that's right. In the United States alone, windmills are killing 1 million birds and 1 million bats every year. And yet I talk to these people in the green organizations and their answer is, well, cats kill birds. You know, that's terrible. Um, that's like saying the murder rate is such and such. So it doesn't matter if I go out and shoot a four more, few more people. That's yeah. terrible. Yeah, it's not rational. It, it's This is the issue, right? Is that it's all a lot emotional uh, reasoning. Right. <laughs> um, and again, for the environment, um, most people don't know that one of the one of the liquids used in the manufacture of solar panels is 8,000 times worse as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And yet, people don't know that. They just think that solar panels look good and sound good and the windmills look good. I used to think that mm -hmm. um, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. But then I got involved in the science behind this and mm -hmm. learned and learn from other people um, the downsides that are well hidden because um, the carbon companies don't want them known. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that ought to tell you something is that the carbon companies are big into promoting wind and solar because they get to still sell a lot of natural gas. One more thing, natural gas is 90% methane. Methane in its youth, when it's first released, is 80 times worse than carbon dioxide. Um, and all the fracking that we have done to get natural gas um, leaks like crazy, as does the natural gas distribution system. Studies show that so far, the leakage from natural gas from wells and the distribution system in the US is offsetting all of the gains we've made by cutting back on coal. This is, this is the problem when you let people who don't know the science make the energy decisions. They're good people, but they lean too much to listen to the industry representatives who have one motive and that's to make money. Mm. Yeah, very, very good points. Very good points. Um, so basically, the, the questions I had also was, um, what are, um, why is it safer, uh, for instance, to use thorium? But you already described that, so you already answered this. So then my second question is, what are the radiation dangers of thorium molten salt versus coal? Oh. Um, well, first of all, most people don't realize that burning coal actually shoots out the smokestack more radiation than today's conventional nuclear plants. There are radioactive elements in coal. And when you burn coal, those are atomized and go right up the stack and are spread around. You're better off living next to a nuclear power plant than downwind of a coal plant. Um, um, let's see if there's anything to add to that. Um, I think this fear of radiation has been um, promoted by basically the coal people. Uh, I think you, you might know that in Australia, the coal miners run ads saying that nuclear power will kill the coal industry. They come right out and say it, and they're right but they're putting their jobs ahead of the environment 
And we've got to get beyond that. They can be retrained in other work. And, and, they, and they should be. Um, there is no, thorium ore uh, is not particularly, you can handle it. It's no problem. Um, it's only in the reactor when it gets converted into another isotope that it becomes the sort of thing that you don't want to handle. Mm. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, the uh, final residue is so small. And actually, if I recall correctly, instead of storing that for thousands of years, I think 350 years is about the limit and the amount mm -hmm. is small. So it's not an issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much for answering that. You're very welcome. <laughs> One more thing, and this is so obvious, I don't know why I didn't think of it long ago and pe most people don't. We're concerned about global warming, right? So what do we do? We cut down a forest and we put these solar panels there. The forest was absorbing carbon dioxide and making oxygen. Um, and now we put these solar panels there that we have to keep clean. Um, and it's a terrible trade-off. What you've done is you've shoved all the wildlife out of that area. And in some countries, in the United States, we're talking thousands of acres. And you can, they do the same thing on cropland. There's people in the world starving. And here we are covering up cropland with uh, solar panels. Um, another thing that's been done and has proven to be a failure actually is these uh, um, central solar farms that focus mirrors on a tower in which uh, there are liquids they heat, um, which generate steam to make electricity. Um, there's a huge one in California, another I think in Nevada. Both of them have proved to be so inefficient that they've had their contracts canceled, multi-million dollar projects. Spain was huge into this uh, central uh, solar farm business. And uh, I can't remember the uh, particular name of it. And they have closed most of them. We go after things that look good and sound good and feel good without doing the science. And we're hurting the environment by doing it. It's terrible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what I have a, a counter question also. What would you say um, to someone, for instance, that says it takes a very long time to build uh, these molten salt reactors? Like, because this is one of the critiques, right? That it takes 50 right. years to build a plant. <laughs> Right. First of all, uh, it doesn't take 50 years. It does take a long time to build a conventional big reactor, mm -hmm. but it doesn't take long to mm -hmm. build these small modular, modular molten salt reactors. Uh, we could have a lot of them in five years if we had a moonshot program, which we should have, that's properly financed but you have to have an educated public pressuring the legislators and an educated legislature. Um, at the moment, we don't, but we're getting there. Um, in the United States, um, the, the mood is changing. Um, I think people are waking up and I think that climate change is the reason they are getting serious. And one final thing, the pandemic we are having, it is no exaggeration to say that is just a prelude to the consequences we are going to see with climate change if we do not make every effort to slow its advance. Mm -hmm. I would not tell people then we could reverse it because I don't believe that's true. But if we do the right things, we can certainly slow it down and maybe come up with something like fusion, which would be a huge help. Yeah, I see. And okay, last question. What would you say to people who say, for instance, that solar and wind, there will be better batteries and they will become more effective because the technology will advance and we will get better at storing the energy and this will meet all our demands. What would you say to those? First of all, solar and wind are now mature technologies. They've been around a long time. There are very few significant improvements. 
regarding batteries, people have no concept of how inefficient batteries are. If you took, for example, every battery out of every vehicle in California and you stored uh, for them at full capacity, that would take care of California's energy needs for about four hours. Um, and they don't think of the carbon footprint of making batteries. Um, if you're going to compare energy use, you have to start with shovel in the ground. And then you have to go with refining it. Then you have to go with building the product or the facility. Then you have to consider useful life. And then you have to consider recycling um, and see what the carbon footprint of this thing you're talking about is. But people don't do that. If they did that, we wouldn't be having wind and solar. Uh, Warren Buffett, I don't know if you're familiar with that name. Mm -hmm. he, he is a US multi-billionaire, uh, intelligent investor, has stated publicly, without the subsidies, wind and solar are losers. We're propping them up by pouring tax money into them. Um, and it's terrible because it's an environmental tragedy. Mm -hmm. And how would you say also the recycling of these batteries? Would you would you consider that a problem? Yes, <laughs> uh, conventional lead batteries are recycled, and that's a good thing. But we're not talking about lead. We're talking about lithium uh, and other um, rare earth type batteries, which you have to mine. Where they are mining for these rare earths that are needed for the permanent magnets for, let's say, windmills or for some of the materials in solar panels, the pollution in China is terrific. Mm -hmm. um, um, and it's getting to be uh, not only that, they are already to have a huge problem with recycling solar panels. Um, people in the book that I wrote can see um, images of this sort of thing of the solar, of the windmill blades that you cannot recycle, you have to chop them up and bury them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and many landfills will not accept them at all. Um, there is nothing really good to say, uh, well, there is one good thing to say about wind or solar. It should be restricted to places where there is no access to the grid. If you have an island, in a, uh, I mean, a a community on a remote island, it is economically sensible to put up solar panels or a wind tower. Um, but if you have access to the grid, it's far better on the environment and it's more economical. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>